Hello everyone, welcome to the presentation of bringing cutting to composite fiber parts into the 21st century. My name is Victor Martins Augusto. I am going to show you the present situation and what we propose for the future. And basically the contents of this presentation will be a short explanation of what composite fiber parts are and how they are produced. Then the main topic will be the finishing of those parts. And we will talk about the challenges that we were faced. Finally, I will speak about the solution we are developing and presenting to our customer, which consists in capturing a, a path, which will then be replayed by a machine. And I will talk about the, the challenges we still are facing and, and trying to overcome. A little bit about myself. My name is Vitor Martins Augusto. I was born in Germany. I lived there until I was 14. I then came to Porto in Portugal, where I finished high school at uh, the German school to Porto. Then I went and studied engineer, engineering, metallurgical engineering and material science at the University of Porto, where I graduated in 94. I immediately started to work at Norcam. And back then, Norcam was the Portuguese distributor of Delcam. Uh, Delcam is the company that was purchased later on by Autodesk and that produced the known products like Power Mill, uh, Power Shape, Power Inspect, Featurecam as well. And in the year of 2000, I was invited to lecture at university, where I am now responsible for the CAPCAM CHI and computer science classes of the Metallurgical Engineering and Material Science course. Today I am a shareholder of Norcam. Norcam is nowadays a Autodesk certified make cam reseller and my duties are mainly post-sales support and customer specific R&D. We were contacted by an existing customer about the finishing of composite parts. So I want to start to explain or briefly explain what a composite part is. Basically, any part that is produced by a mixture of different materials is called a composite part. In the Middle Age, when they built a house mixing clay and straw, that was already a composite part. In this case, we are talking about composite fiber parts and here, the process consists of combining several layers of a tissue made of fiber, could be glass fiber, carbon fiber, whatever, with a bonding material, which is normally epoxy or some other kind of resin. So basically, you apply resin, glue some uh, sheet of fabric onto it, then you deploy another layer of, of resin and another layer of, of fabric. This goes on and on until you build up your part. Once this part is finished and all the layers have been deposited, the finished part is then cured in an autoclave. An autoclave is basically a furnace which operates with a vacuum. The vacuum will extract all air that's trapped inside the part and the heat will bond the resin to the fiber. As a result, we get a very high strength part with a very low weight. Other characteristics include uh, a high resistance to fatigue, the absence of corrosion problems, it will have a high resistance to rupture and wear, and also a very low thermal expansion. So this makes this material excellent for many different applications like aeronautics, you will find composite parts in, in airplanes and space parts. You will find this in racing cars uh, or high-end high uh, cars. You will find this as well in completely different applications like, for example, windmill blades or jacuzzis or swimming pools are made out of composite fiber parts. Another application in our customer in particular does a lot of this is parts for buses. When you see a big part that looks like plastic in a bus, it's not plastic, it's composite fiber. So very interesting material and basically very resistant, light, stable, slow, low thermal expansion rate. 
it's a really nice, nice material. However, there are some issues. And I took the time to, to include in this presentation an outlook on what a plant like looks like. So when we are talking about a composite part and we speak about aerospatial applications, we think of very high tech. And then you see the reality and the shop floor looks like this. This is like a whole big common uh, area where everything happens. The parts are moved around on a table with wheels and there is no separate work uh, uh, environment. Everything happens in this open space, which means that as soon as you park your car and open the door, you will smell the resin. And once you enter this shop floor, you will start getting dizzy after five minutes because of the resin smell. It's a very harmful environment and I will stress this further on. So how are the parts built? The parts start with an empty mold and what you see in this picture is basically an empty mold. Now the interesting thing is that the composite fiber mold may actually be made out of composite fiber itself. So the process is you may receive a prototype part and you deposit the fiber on top of the composite part and when you remove the, com the, the, the fiber from, from your, your prototype part, this fiber is actually a replica, an inverse replica of the part, so you can use it as a mold. And all the, the layers of fiber will be deposited on top of this surface. So first, the workers will deploy a special coating, which will facilitate the removal of the part from the mold. And on the next step, they will apply the first layer of resin. On top of this layer of resin, they will then glue sheets of fabric made of fiber and they need to take special care, especially on the first layer, so that they don't leave any, any openings or gaps or wrinkles on the fabric that's close to the mold because this will be the outer surface of the final part. So this is a very labor intensive work. And if you can smell the resin once you enter the, the, the plant, doing this process and standing next to these workers will definitely get you completely dizzy if you're not used to the resin smell. So I have my doubts on how safe it is to work here on a, on a, on a daily basis. So they will roll up the, the fabric sheet by sheet and layer by layer they will apply this. Now this fabric in particular has one advantage. If you look at, at, at the picture, you will see that the fibers uh, have a random orientation, which means that in this case, the workers do not have to rotate the sheets uh, layer by layer in order to get a uniform strength on the part because the, the fabric itself already has uh, the, the fibers in, in random directions. However, they still have to be very careful to make sure that each layer of fabric fully covers the whole extent of the surface, which is not easy because the surface is not flat. So when you have corners like in, in, in this region, you will have to eventually cut uh, the, the fabric in order to make sure that you are able to apply it uniformly over the whole surface. And this layer by layer to make sure that the final part has a, has a, a continuous and equal uh, thickness. Mm -hmm. So this goes on. It takes quite some effort to, to produce a part like this, which is why these parts are not cheaper. And then once the part is finished, you can see here in the background a few finished parts. These parts can be combined and glued together to form a, a, the, the, the finished product. This finished product is glued together, is painted, and then we are inside the autoclave. The doors close, a vacuum is applied, so to extract any trapped air inside this part, and then the resin will be activated by heat, and this will cause the sheets of fiber to bond 
and produce a very stiff, very hard and uh, robust part. This now leads us to the finishing of the part because you, you want to have the total of the surface of the mold covered, it will be normally covered by excess. So this has to be trimmed. Also, it is very difficult for the workers that apply the, the sheets of, of fiber and the resin to deal with holes. Normally, the holes are then cut out at the finishing process. I have a, a movie which is rather long, it's eight minutes, but I will comment it and I think it's worthwhile seeing the current state of the art in cutting uh, uh, these parts. And we were called by this customer to see how we could improve this. So I will play this video. You can see the noise, I will reduce the, the volume. It has a, a very annoying noise. And so basically, the finishing of the part is done by manual labor with an operator holding a grinder. And whenever he's grinding, the first thing you can see is that it produces a lot of dust. This dust is, of course, cancerigenous and it will strongly irritate your throat. So lots and lots of powder. And if you look at the background, you can see one operator who's grinding He's using a mask, but all the powder is actually being sent to the other operator who's not even wearing a mask. So there are some really considerable health issues. Another thing you can notice is that you need a really steady hand to cut these parts. Here he is trying to cut a straight line. And even though we are not using any metrology, just by looking at it, you can see that this line is far from being straight. What he's doing is, <clears throat> he's guiding himself through some lines that have been drawn with a marker on top of this part. So he's cutting and following the, the marker. Another remarkable thing you can notice is that there is absolutely no jig or, or uh, uh, fixture being used for the part. The part is simply put on a table and the operator is using the grinder to cut as precise as possible along the line that has been drawn on the part. Once he finishes this cutout, you will see how he will remove the cutout. What he has to do is he has to make the four cuts without actually crossing them because the cutout would be floppy and then it would be impossible to further cut it. So the part is not fully cut yet, but then he will basically rip this off and you can see how he treats the part. This is far from precision work, I would say. And now we are entering the final uh, uh, stage of, of the finishing where he will cut these windows. Now, these windows, these, these, these cutouts he, he will make now, they have a particular design feature which consists of not having a purely rectangular shape, but the designer uh, decided to give this some sexy appeal by adding a chamfer in the corner. Now, you will see the amount of extra work this, this chamfer will cause this operator. And you will see that, in fact, the chamfer is the smallest possible detail this operator can cut into the part. I will advance a little bit so that we have, are not getting too bored with this. So he's just still cutting with the big grinder the, the, the lines. Then he will change the big grinder for a smaller grinder. And with the smaller grinder, he will now cut the chamfers. And this is really far from being high precision because he has difficulty in accessing it and also the angle he uses to, to cut the, the, the chamfers are different from chamfer to chamfer. And again, he has to be careful to not fully cut through because otherwise the cutout will be floppy and, 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 and dangling around, which will then uh, make it difficult to remove the, the to, to finalize the, the cutting. So I will advance a little bit more. And 
once he finishes this, and in this case, you can see that this chamfer will be actually shorter than the other chamfers because he was not able to fully control the geometry. Once he, he finishes this, he will use a high technology approach to actually remove these cutouts. And advancing a little bit, he's still doing the, the straight lines. Now again with a big uh, uh, tool, with a big grinder. And once he finishes this, he will take basically a hammer and will hit the parts with a hammer to remove them. Again, I'm not sure if this will cause any distortions in, in the remainder of the part. Certainly, this is not the best approach. You can also see that the cutout is not very precise. And yeah, this is the high-tech finishing of, of this composite part. Uh, what you can also notice is that the whole finishing of this part took more than eight minutes labor time. And yeah, so we united everything we saw here at Norcam, and we made basically a list of all the problems. And this was used to decide how we can tackle these and, and present the customer with a modern solution to this problem. So the first problem is of course the harmful environment not only the resin, but especially the fiber dust, which is really a, a health issue. The accuracy is low. It depends on the operator. It depends on the size of the grinder. The geometry of the cutouts is limited to the size of the grinder. Straight cuts require steady hand. If you do the first cut in the morning, I can imagine that it will be straight, perhaps after six hours of cutting parts, it will be not that straight anymore. The drilling with a manual drilling tool has probably also serious accuracy issues, but especially this is a labor intensive job. It is a low paid job. These people earn minimum wage, which causes the operator to move to other jobs after a short period. And this is actually one of the biggest problems our customer faces. A regular operator works one month, two months, and then he doesn't show up anymore, or he quits, or he gets a different job, because being paid a, a minimum wage to do this the whole day in a harmful environment is not uh, very attractive to, to any, any worker. So at Norton, we started to brainstorm what we could do about this. And while there was not too much we could do about the resins now, uh, it was clear that fiber dust could be avoided and, and minimized by using an enclosed work cell. So if we had some enclosed uh, robot cell or CNC uh, center, machining center with uh, uh, air filtering, that would be easily fixed. The accuracy issues could be improved a lot by implying, uh, employing a CNC mill or a robot or whatever. Uh, Using a cutting tool instead of a grinder, we could uh, overcome the limitations in, in, in details and in, in smallest uh, sizes. We could introduce fillets instead of chamfers. So this would improve the geometry. Drilling could be obviously improved by CNC as well. So everything is pointing towards using a CNC or a robot cell. However, during the brainstorm, we recognized that it must be an easy to learn process for low skilled operators. So here we start to question ourselves if these low skilled operators would be able to use this technology. And then there was a major no go, which is the alignment. If there is no fixture or jig, and often there isn't even a CAD data, how should we be able to actually program? The, the tool part and how should we align the part in the machine. So this was uh, something that was not clear to us how we should overcome it. Anyway, our first idea was what I guess anyone in this industry would think about. We would use some form of 3D scanner to scan the part, which is fixed to a table. Then we would, for example, use PowerShape Ultimate to do a reverse engineering and generate a proper STL uh, uh, 
mesh out of the scanned data. Perhaps we could use parent spec ultimate to do a best fit alignment so that we could then synchronize the scanning with the machining. And we would of course use Power Mill Premium or Ultimate to produce five axis toolpath programmed directly on top of the STL surface we obtained in PowerShape Ultimate. So this was our first idea on how to tackle this problem. However, it's easy to see that the resulting solution has a major issue. It is a very complex solution and it requires, without any doubt, skilled CAD CAM operators who are not pleased with the minimum wage. So, yeah, this, is a, this idea is feasible but probably would not uh, get us anywhere. So, we continue to think until a new idea popped up, which seemed rather silly at the beginning. Why not capture the toolpath with a measuring arm? This would be easy to use because the person that normally would use the marker to mark where the operator would have to use the grinder to cut the part, what if we would replace the marker by a metrology arm and the guy using the marker would just move the metrology arm across the line that needs to be cut. This way, we would actually solve the problem of the alignment and of the lack of cut data, and it wouldn't even matter if the part is distorted or if the part is floppy and, and, and moves itself by, 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 it, by gravity alone. That wouldn't make any difference. So as stupid as this ideas seemed at the first moment, uh, we still started to wonder about it. And the next conclusion we got was that a metrology arm actually uses the same kinematic as a robot. So if you look at the image of the, the arm next to the robot, you will see they share the same number of axes. So this means that in principle, we could scan a line with the arm and make sure that if a robot had to reproduce the same line, there would be no singularities, no axis limits overrides, and there would be no collisions either. So suddenly this idea, this crazy idea, started to look actually pretty neat. So to replay the toolpath, we would just send the points to power mill, this would produce a five axis toolpath. And then we would just simulate and post process this using the PowerMill robot interface. And because this could all be automated, even an unskilled operator would be able to work with this solution. However, there were some challenges. The first challenge is we had a microscribe arm in the office. But if you look at the size of the microscribe arm compared to the robot we had in our office, you will immediately see that they are completely different sizes. Also, the standard part at, at our customer is about three meters by two meters, which is totally unreachable for a microscribe arm. So if the arm is too small to scan or digitize the line you want to cut, then this would be a no-go. So we had to find a metrology arm that was big enough to scan the, the parts that our customer has. And ideally, the arm would have to have the same size as the robot cell we were going to, to apply. So we start looking at the market and we actually found a manufacturer that had standard sized arms that were big enough for our application. We did not want to have custom made arms because then the price would not be feasible. So we found a manufacturer with attractive prices. The size of the arm was big enough for our application. And very important, the manufacturer was able to provide us with an API so that we could program our own application to receive directly the coordinates from the arm. The next challenge was we needed to get the points from the arm into power mode. So because the selected arm has an API that was provided to us, API, an application programming interface, we were able to use C-sharp 
to receive directly from the arm the coordinates of the captured points and send them into Power Mill using the Autodesk automation interface, which is now open source. So, because we could also interface directly to the buttons of the arm, we could distinguish if the operator is actually capturing points or if he's just moving the arm to reposition it, the, the arm. And we could then use a combination of, of key presses to determine if we are capturing uh, cutting moves or air moves. The next challenge was, how do we get the toolpath we just created inside Power Mill so that the robot can execute it? This was actually the easiest part of the whole process because we could just rely on the Power Mill robot interface. So after generating the five axis toolpath automatically, the operator only had to simulate this toolpath. And because of the way that Power Mill robot interface works, the running of the simulation is also basically the post processing. So we could automate this. It was very versatile because using Power Mill robot interface, we suddenly have a solution for any robot manufacturer because Power Mill robot interface comes with a, a huge database of all major robot manufacturers. And even if you would encounter a robot that is not supported, we could add it to the database by doing the post-processor and simulator. So this was the easiest part, actually. And we found some, further on, we found some other challenges. One was that using the spherical tip of the metrology arm, sliding over a, a, a composite fiber surface is not uh, very precise because uh, the, the shear does not give a very nice uh, contact with the surface. So we have been trying to replace the sphere with, with other shapes, including like a corner shape, which allow a permanent contact with corners inside the shape, because normally the trimming happens after a small corner in the part. So this could be improved. The other challenge of our uh, solution is that the price of the complete solution when compared with a simple grinder, which costs a few couple of hundreds of, of euros, uh, and being operated by a low wage operator, having a solution where you have to purchase a metrology arm, a power mill subscription, and all the training and, and, and implementation, this is an initial obstacle. However, it was uh, well accepted by the customer that he gets a better accuracy, he can do much smaller details, and above all, the operator has a more rewarding job, and this will probably allow the, the operator to stay at this company for much longer period because he, have, he has suddenly a healthier job and a more easy and technological job, which is more pleasant than having to hold a grinder all day. So we also think that the, the, the price point uh, will, be, will not be an obstacle because it's just a matter of time that environmental reg and, and health regulations will actually forbid the use of, of workers using a grinder to cut uh, composite materials because it is really a, a health issue. So the final solution we came up with is shown in this small video. Uh, basically, you open Power Mill, you have a plugin, you connect to the arm, you say that you want to capture points, and then you just take the arm, and once you click the, the button, a five-axis toolpath is instantly created in real time in Power Mill, following exactly the same route that the arm uh, uh, is doing. As soon as you let go of the button, the five axis toolpath is created and can be simulated. And you can then send this to the, to the robot. It's as simple as this. It's actually quite amazing how simple it is. And we added uh, some other functionality, for example, to drill holes. Holes at these parts is difficult because if you're holding a, a drilling uh, machine with the hand, it will slip from the marked point, whereas a robot will not slip. 
So it's very easy. You just take the arm again and you just point it to the positions where you want to make the hole and click the button and you get a, a, a hole made. What this colleague is doing in the video now is if you need to make alignment, you just take three points. This will create a work plane. And then you capture the same three points with the robot cell and create the equivalent robot uh, work plane. And this is all you need to do to make sure that the alignment is done. If the arm and the robot share the same space in a, in a fixed position, you can actually align the arm against the robot and then you do not have to follow this alignment step. But otherwise, if you have separate spaces, if you want to be able to move the arm around, you just need to capture three points and make sure to capture the same three points with the robot. And that's all the alignment you have to do. And here we say, see the robot performing exactly the same uh, toolpath that was created by the arm. So as a conclusion, I can say that PowerMill offers a great amount of functionality. But sometimes PowerMill is a bit frightening because it has so much functionality and you cannot expect a unskilled operator to quickly learn PowerMill. But thanks to the programming API provided by Autodesk for PowerMill and the macro language that PowerMill has, custom solutions can be quickly developed. And for specific and repetitive tasks, you can automate PowerMill to an extent where even an unskilled operator can produce five axis toolpath, which are collision free, in this case, by just using a metrology arm as, as the guide. We call this uh, offline teach and learn. And it showed as well that going to a customer with two or three engineers from us and then sitting down and brainstorming on what we saw and allowing people to come up with what seems to be crazy or stupid ideas often is the birth of, of some amazing technology. And at this point, we are wondering what else can be used, what other things could be done with a, sim a, a solution where you take an arm and whatever you do with the arm will then be repeated with a robot. So it's not just cutting. You can imagine painting or depositing fiber or depositing whatever. So it is really nice to see that we can use PowerMill, but instead of relying on complex CAD-based programming, we can just import a toolpath, but then use the whole PowerMill environment to simulate and post-process the toolpath. Our customer, Fibrauto, who already was our customer not to cut the, the composite parts, but to actually produce the molds with a robot cell, uh, started out trying our new solution with a robot cell, but then instead of deciding to purchase the second robot cell for the finishing of parts, they actually decided to use a five axis router to finish the parts. And for us, this is absolutely no problem because as soon as we have the five axis toolpath created with the arm inside PowerMill, we can still simulate it and then just use the Autodesk post-process utility to post-process for whatever five-axis uh, milling machine. So our solution is right now being implemented and I think this will greatly improve the way that uh, composite fiber parts are finished and we are definitely moving away from using grinders and, and, and doing a manual, manual finishing of, of these parts. So I hope this has been interesting for everyone. If you have any questions, please drop me an email, vma at norcom.pt. I think there will be a Q&A session as well. I hope this was interesting. It basically showed that if you know a little bit of C-sharp, a little bit of Visual Basic, get familiar with the PowerMill macro language. It is amazing how much you can, you can accomplish with this technology. And I think for, for programming a five axis toolpath with an arm, there are many, many opportunities. If you can remember any, or if you want to discuss any possible uh, opportunity where this kind of technology could be used, drop me an email. I'm more than happy to, to discuss this with you. So thank you very much. Goodbye, stay safe. Thank you.